Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise on Bill C-48, an act to amend the Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador Atlantic Accord Implementation Act and Canada, Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Resources Accord Implementation Act and make consequential amendments to other acts. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, this is about renewable projects that will start to move forward. And coming from my neck of the woods, um, Windsor, Ontario, the auto industry, uh, where we've seen Canada fall from number two in assembly in the world. I'm the Honourable Member for uh, Prince George, Caribou, Caribou Prince George. just want to give our Honourable colleague an opportunity to correct himself. Uh, I believe he's standing up talking on Bill C-48, and uh, I think the topic today is C-49. Thank you. Uh, we, we all know we're talking to Bill C-49, so just make sure we're all we're talking to that. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At least I appreciate my colleagues listening to me, so that's good. <laughs> it is Bill C-49. I appreciate the correction. Uh, we wouldn't want that left in the stand in the record of all the things here. Um, so what I want to talk about is a little connection in terms of my community and renewables that are taking place, but also what's taking place uh, with this bill in Atlantic Canada. And the reason I asked my previous question about 911 calls that were dropped is that we saw uh, basically the East Coast suffer significantly from climate change uh, that we're witnessing across the globe and also across Canada. Everything from wild fires to a number of different rain and other type of flooding events. And then even in my region, there's consequences that are taking place with the Great Lakes uh, being in southern Ontario. And I think it's important when we do public policy that we start to remediate and look at some of the consequences of poor actions by conservatives and liberals in the past when it comes to the telco industry and communications, which are paramount in this. And I've spoken many times in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, about the fact that we are in our current problem with regards to cell phone, especially rural service, um, because we chose to do that. So this government and the previous government set up an auction process for our spectrums. And what they did is they gobbled up over $20 billion of money from the spectrum auctions uh, since basically two th year 2000. It's around $23 billion. And then what they did is they're making Canadians pay some of the highest prices because we don't have a telephone bill of rights. And at the same time, where did that money go? Successive governments from Cretchen to Martin to Harper and now our current administration that we have right now have taken and raked all that cash in and at the same time have had no regulations on prices and accountability. And the accountability part is important, Mr. Speaker, because in 2018 we witnessed a terrible situation in here in Ottawa with regards to tornadoes and we had special hearings about that because 911 was out for a period of time or was reduced in services and quality and so forth. And we know that even this past summer, the same thing just took place again in the Nova Scotia Halifax region. And shame on us for not forcing the telcos to actually provide better, reliable service. And yes, I know it's interesting because the minister, you know, when the Rogers thing, he picked up the phone and called Rogers and, and said, oh yeah, they, when, when he speaks, they're going to actually listen and they're going to do something. It sounds like the grocery store plan that he has right now with the CEOs. We know it didn't work because Rogers, at the end of the day, just recently sued the Competition Bureau in a tribunal process where they're getting Canadian taxpayers' money for the, the Competition Bureau fighting for Canadians against the actual uh, acquisition of Shaw. So you have a system here in place where it's run amok. And the consequences under climate change for communication are real as we move faster and quicker away from landlines, and especially with the cost of operations, people can't afford basically phone cell phone plans like family plans and other things and a landline anymore. So, and then other services are not available anymore. And so it's a public interest aspect that's key and critical to our public policy because the spectrum auction and the way that we actually roll out and have these companies abuse Canadians can all be taken in-house here. And we have seen other countries do that. But we won't do it because they lobby so hard and they basically have a hands-off policy because we don't have a telco bill of rights that the NDP have been fighting for and because we don't use a spectrum auction to make sure that we have lower prices, better access and actually higher accountability. So we haven't done any of those things. And what I'm worried about, Mr. Speaker, is that with this bill here, we still have public policy that's void in the gap and the difference that we can actually improve as transition takes place with climate change. And so one of the things that's taken place in my region is with the auto sector. And before I was, I, you know, I made the mistake of saying C48 and 
and now it's 349, we're talking about, I was mentioning about the transition in the auto sector. In my region, we were number two in the world in assembly, and we've dropped to eighth. Um, and so we've had to fight back most recently, and especially because without a national auto policy, we've been slow off the mark for transitioning to a greener, cleaner auto industry. I think we did our first um, press conference with Joe Comartin, David Suzuki uh, in Windsor on a green auto strategy back in 2006. And that's when also I showed the film Who Killed the Electric Car that was original GM vehicle that was um, a, a, a clean green machine that they took off the market. But what now we're seeing is finally some good transition. So yesterday we had the parliamentary budget officer in front of industry committee and I was asking questions because we have recent announcements on Volkswagen and Stellantis, which add up to about $28 billion. And the parliamentary budget officer, you know, mentioned that, you know, these returns would not be as quick as the government was saying. So it was a really good hearing to get at that. But what we realized through the testimony is still was a better deal than when you look at the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And he had to basically look at the two situations as requested and the Trans Mountain Pipeline is already up to $31 billion and has less jobs connected to it and also has greater environmental degradation related to it. And then meanwhile, on the Volkswagen and the Stellantis deal, the money is also only guaranteed for the most part if there's going to be battery production. And we have to meet it because, you know, our free market American friends have brought in the Investment Reduction Act, Inflation Reduction Act, and they are subsidizing massively their capital investments into the auto industry and other factors. In fact, they're just ramping up. I was at the National State Legislature's meetings this past uh, summer, and this will be another year coming up and another year after that with Democrats and Republicans spending more money than ever before and doing it through corporate subsidization. And that's loud because of our situation with regards to a trade agreement. So all we did was match what the U.S. did for Stellantis and Volkswagen. And thank goodness, is a good shout out for our Unifor workers who have been at the forefront for transition uh, for the economy for auto from day one. Dave Cassidy and others in my region, um, you know, uh, John Dagnolo, others um, have been out the forefront uh, making sure that we actually have a green transition economy and we actually get some of the new plants we're getting. And why that's important, Mr. Speaker, because those vehicles are shipped um, primarily in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world and we'll actually start to be able to compete. So the point being is that at least with that transition, we're going to see some improvements in the job guarantee components and the subsidy. Some of it goes to the capital operations, but the vast majority goes to production of creating something. Whereas we know with the Trans Mountain Pipeline, I've asked him, and we didn't want to put him on a spot at that time, with which investment would he choose, it's just basically out the door kind of all the time. There's no, there's no qualifications on any of that whatsoever. So it was an interesting conversation that we had yesterday. And it fits well with what we're trying to do with climate change and trying to reduce emissions on vehicles. And the auto industry um, has been one of the more, I guess, centralized themes of producing and, and creating uh, some of the, the toughest things that we have to change, but they also offer some of the potential solutions. You look at some of the products that are coming out now for the auto industry with this transition with batteries and so forth, they're also becoming generators and capacity in your own home. So you actually have other uh, subsequent um, uh, issues that you can actually apply your automotive vehicle for in your house to actually reduce emissions. So there's, there's, a, there's a new future with that coming forward. And why that applies even also to this act is because it's going to help offset you know, other areas of climate change. And you look at Newfoundland, Labrador, Halifax, and you look at the offshore capabilities, those are also some of the things that we're done in my region with regards to uh, windmills and wind turbines. Not perfect by any means, but they're also part of the solution to continue to advance uh, different types of energy. Now, sadly, the McGuinty government at that time and the wind government, they brought in a bad policy uh, that still lingers to this day on it. And so that's why we'll have to be looking to make sure that C49 is going to be a solid bill at the end of the day and has subsequent follow through because 
what they did is they brought in some private sector proponents and it turned into be, basically being a financial fundraiser when it comes to uh, the issue of um, the Green Energy Act that was passed in Ontario. And so the important aspect of this is that when we see these projects and the subsidies going forward to them and the policies that are happening as if people feel confidence in them. And, and that's what I'm hoping will come from this bill and when we have some of the different types of elements that actually become real and substantial, people will support them. And I noticed a difference in my community significantly when it comes to the auto sector because we have basically one of the most successful manufacturing plants from the Second World War building the Chrysler minivan. It's now Stellantis, but it was then a Chrysler. And, and it's interesting because, I mean, we fought for years in this House and Chamber for a, you know, a basically an auto policy uh, that would be transparent. And that's what's going to be necessary for new projects um, on C49. So that was part of the discussion yesterday when we had the parliamentary budget officer in place is that I noted that at that time we had to rescue Chrysler's in the past and that's led to a plant that still exists there today and the government made money on it, was done right. Most recently we've had some auto investment for um, uh, helping General Motors and others and had the Conservatives actually not cashed in the shares that they got from General Motors, we would have actually made more money on that investment, but they cashed them out early for ideological reasons and we didn't get the return that we should have had. In fact, I stood here in this chamber um, when Jim Flaherty said we can't pick winners or losers and we couldn't do anything about it, but thank goodness he did switch his position. I'm always eternally grateful for that. He was very much um, a hard worker and somebody that you could approach and someone who did a lot of work for Canada and he switched his position on that and that's how we actually rescued General Motors at that time despite the objections of many different people and parties. And it was a forethought that this could actually open up new investment that we're getting now, not only just in the Oshawa area, but Ingersoll and other places where we see the auto return. In fact, it's coming back to Quebec, thank goodness. The St. Therese plant uh, closed a long time ago and that was a shame because our auto investment and our supply chain was critical along the lines and it was important to actually rescue that plant but at that time there was no support from the government and it was unfortunately lost and that's one of the returns we're seeing now is they will be involved in new battery manufacturing which is critical because Ontario and Quebec manufacturing is very solid. So when projects come forward on this bill I'm hoping there's also going to be the potential for other provinces to tap into some of the manufacturing, supply and servicing that's going to be required for some of the new uh, investments for clean energy. Uh, we've seen that um, a number of different years in our region as parts of the manufacturing took place for the wind turbines in Windsor and Essex County and then other places it had to be shipped in. Uh, some of it was shipped in from overseas but there was a lot domestically produced so we have an advantage hopefully right now to start to prepare and also start to be the manufacturers of the materials, goods, services and servicing. And as a side topic to some of this, the planning has to be done. Because when looking at energy, I have been long time critic of the, uh, d the deep uh, re uh, repository for nuclear waste that's being proposed in the Bruce Peninsula area. They want to do this, Mr. Speaker. They want to do a record, one of the first places ever in the world to do this, bury nuclear waste next to some of the largest freshwater reserves in the world. And there's only been a couple other uh, these facilities have been built and they've either caught on fire or they've leaked. And they want to build and bury for over 100 million years. And that, Mr. Speaker, is a legacy of nuclear waste that we have to actually factor in. And so there's a decision pending on that. The government and other members have been quiet on this. I have not because I've been there. I, I've seen what's happening is that the, the community is being greased by the nuclear industry um, in, in terms of getting extra resources and a number of different things. There's a lobbying that's going on and that's fine. But the same pack in issue is it has to be based upon reasonable expectations. And ironically, the original proposal was turned down by Saugeen First Nations. So what did they they, they do. They just moved up and moved a mile uh, off the site and then proposing a new one right there. And so the point that I have with that is that there's a legacy cost involved in all of this and servicing cost. And we have to build those in. And that's why 
This opportunity on Bill C-49 is important for jobs in the economy, and it's important that we actually try to get in front of some of the domestic work that we can do, and, and that's critical. So the climate change aspect is critical in this because to fight back on these things, it's going to take large projects, but also small projects. It's important that we actually feel momentum, that we can control some of these measures and have an input because everybody just turns on the TV and you see the mess that's taking place, not only just in Canada, but other places in the world. And I get a lot of young people saying, what can we really do? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do from our own behavior to our country's behavior and internationally how we respond to this. And so one of the things I have as a private member's bill on Ojibwe National Urban Park is to do that, is to actually create a green space um, that is actually going to stop flooding. Um, it's going to soak up the resources um, that are the negative with regards to the water and the spillage that can take place into industrial areas and also homes and, and other residential areas. And it's also going to have an effect for 200 of Canada's 500 endangered species. And so when we look at these projects that are taking place and, 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 and they'll go forward with Bill C-49, I'm hoping they also get community benefits. And I want to talk about community benefits a little bit about this because if the bill then concludes with some of those elements later on, it doesn't have it in now, and that's why local members from that area should be fighting tooth and nail for this addition to it, it's going to provide control and supports for the community. So my first public meeting to get a new border crossing in Windsor was 1998, and we went for a long period of time. We fought off an American billionaire who wanted to twin the Ambassador Bridge and ram it right through the city of the West End and cut us off. We fought off Omers, one of the largest pension funds, uh, who wanted to put a new truck right, right through South Windsor and destroy uh, the environment with a truck route. And we finally got a compromise for a new bridge. And part of the new bridge includes community benefits on both the Canadian and the American side. And those community benefits allow the community also to opt into these larger projects. So it's a $5 billion project. All we could get was $10 million on both sides. But at least a start. It was historic. It was the first time it was done. But the $10 million goes into a community fund where other projects then emerge. And they the conservation money. There's money for homes with regards to greening, offsetting the damage of the construction that's taking place, um, inclusion of projects that will build a legacy. And all those communal things make people feel better and stronger about the massive investment that they get with regards to an energy project or something else. So I, I'm hoping that there's going to be an opportunity for community benefits to be put into this um, bill to ensure people there get to see what we have seen so strong in our area. And again, the community benefits process is everything from not only just the project getting done, but constant community consultation about what those things would be and control. So that's critical when it comes to having some empowerment so that the people feel stronger about the investments, but also the value when they look out and they'll see the windmills and they'll see some of the changes that physically take place. And that was some of the concern that we had with regards to ours. And what also has to happen, and the reason I mentioned the nuclear component and the legacy costs, is we still are, Mr. Speaker, looking at what do we do with the end of the life cycle of a windmill and wind turbine. So we did have some testifying at industry committee most recently about this, and I asked about those things. There's no real plan for any of that right now, because what we don't want to have is to basically have to rip things down and ship them hundreds of miles somewhere else on large transportation platforms that create more greenhouse gas emissions just to be recycled. We have to think about a long-term plan, because now Windsor, Essex County, and Chatham-Kent has a scattering of windmills across it creating green energy, but eventually their lifespan is going to cease and they will either need refurbishment, replacement, or recycling. So these are important elements that we should be building into the cost of things. It's kind of the argument the NDP have been making for years on manufacturing is extended producer liability. And as I wrap up, Mr. Speaker, that's critical because with public funds involved, it's not just the cost of the moment. And this is what federal governments have been really particularly abusive in the past getting in on the capital of something at the very beginning and then walking away from the operation, the legacy and the afterwards. We've seen this even with the housing industry. as so many market rental units right now need fixing up. And as I conclude, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I'm appreciative of the opportunity to speak on this bill because my region has a connection through the work that's been done. But I want to conclude by this and again by saying we have to take seriously the public infrastructure that we had. And why I started with Telco on this 
is because climate change is going to require us to be quicker, faster, more responsive, and no longer should governments be letting these three giants run their, their way with the rest of Canada.